Hello, Dr. Dave Highmarsh, GP Templates. In this video, we're going to touch upon all the relevant aviation rules. So basically, when people come in saying, am I flipped to fly, doc? And again, similar with our other occupational health videos like the DVLA and sick note ones, patients will often think it's a very binary because you're giving them a yes or no answer. But unfortunately, as with most things in life, it's a bit of shades of grey. And just remember that aviation medicine is a speciality in its own right, and each airline will have their own medical services <clears throat> that they can touch upon. All your role as the general practitioner is to provide information to them for them to make the final decision whether they're fit to fly. So, and just here's an example of one. So I've just went onto the British Airways and quick Google and you can see about how to get medical clearance and then you download a PDF form. This is for the patient to do. They hand it to you to provide the relevant information or to countersign it. And then there's a passenger medical clearance unit. And though I, what I suspect is that there will be a team of aviation doctors, perhaps some occupational health nurses as well, who will then sort of oversee this and see whether they're fit to fly. But in this video, we're going to cover the basics of some of those rules that they will cover. So again, this is about uh, occupational health and how really the environment is affecting on the patient and then certain patient conditions may be exacerbated by the environment. So think about what you're doing in an aircraft, okay? You're in a confined space, so you have to sit in your seat and be comfortable for a period of time. In worst case scenarios, you might have to be able to mobilize yourself and sort of exit the plane if it crashes. So already you're thinking, well, hang on a second, if you've got someone who's claustrophobic or got certain psychiatric illnesses, they won't be able to fulfill some of these already. Likewise, if they've got really, really poor mobility, are they actually fit to be on an airplane? Because they won't be able to save themselves if they have to sort of get out from a seat and get down a slide, say, heaven forbid. Don't forget as well, you're at altitude and there'll be a slight reduced air pressure. So if you've got any cardiac conditions, respiratory conditions where reduction in air pressure or oxygen levels will have a detrimental effect to it. Again, thinking, are they fit to fly? So let's go through a couple of cases. So you see an 80, uh, 80 year old who wants a fit to fly letter. So we know what to do already. She's seen in the urgent treatment center due to having fallen and break her arm. She's meant to fly tomorrow. Stick around to the end of the video to see what the answer is. So with cardiac conditions, quite simply, if the condition is not controlled, they cannot fly. And this really covers uh, four main conditions. So angina, arrhythmias, coronary heart, uh, congestive heart failure, and hypertension. So in the question, if you see it saying uncontrolled, they're not fit. So moving on, certain interventions will have a period of time where they're not fit to fly. So if there's about two weeks, if they've had a cabbage or any sort of chest surgery, so with a cardiovascular accident, sort of really shouldn't be flying for 10 days. And it's contraindicated within three days as well. With myocardial infarctions, think about if it's uncomplicated or complicated. So really sort of having a look at what interventions with this. So it could either be anywhere up to 10 days or maybe even up to six weeks. Again, this is where the individual airline should be making that assessment. Pregnancy, this is one that often does come to the GPs. And just to be bear in mind that from 32 weeks onwards, they're not fit to fly if they're carrying a twin pregnancy, or if it's 36 weeks, they're not fit to fly with single pregnancies. What often the GP could get involved is that you have to write a statement saying, I, I know that patient X is due to fly on this date. At this date, I can confirm that they will be so many weeks pregnant, and on their return flight, they will be so many weeks pregnant. Their expected delivery date is this date. And you should have all of that information on the record. The reason why I flag up the GP contracts video, link below, is because this is not funded. So make sure that you charge them for it. Each practice will have its own set policy for a private letter. So moving on to diabetes, make sure, make sure, make sure that if they are using insulin or anything else that the medication is carried with them. Because what you don't want to happen is that they are diabetic and their medication gets lost, which can happen. So make sure that they're carrying it in their hand luggage. Be mindful as well if they are type 1 diabetics or they've got an insulin pump for whatever reason, that certain pumps might not be good with the air pressure. It's one of those that there are quite a few on the market now, but they will be able to see and they, you wouldn't, they might need to get the patient to contact the manufacturer to see whether they are fit to be in an aircraft. I would suspect that they are now. And just 
just remember that if you're traveling then you lose or gain hours depending on how far east or west you're going okay so they might need to alter their insulin regime depending on how far they're going type 2 diabetes generally there's no issue and so there's no sort of restriction to travel but again just think about again making sure they've got access to their medications or keeping in hand luggage so certain hematological conditions. Anemia is the big one. So if they're less than 75, then really you need to have that sort of the question of do they need oxygen? Okay. And again, you should be sort of going straight to the airlines for that. If you've got sickle cell disease, it's contraindicated 10 days after crisis. And again, they might need oxygen as well as the hypoxia may trigger another crisis and you don't want that to happen. DVT, big one. Okay, so if you think about there are certain risk factors, prolonged flight, previous DVTs, thrombophilia, and if they're a bit older or oral contraceptives, generally there's sort of loose guidance on terms of, say, if they're of normal health, and you can always advise patients to, say, get flight socks. For those who are significantly higher risk, so thinking about your thrombophilia, normally the haematologist will write and recommend what they need. I've seen a mixture of needing, say, tinzapyrin, heparin, and even I've seen some uh, short course of DOAX for whilst they are traveling. Again, there should be some guidance, not from you, but from the specialist. Aspirin was in vogue, and it seems that because of the risks of taking aspirin are greater than the benefits for it, and that is not recommended. But again, just the basics, flight socks, maintaining hydration, and also mobilizing whilst you're on the aircraft. So think about respiratory conditions. A really good rule of thumb was that if you can walk 50 meters or climb one flight of stairs without being short of breath, then actually you're likely to be okay. Otherwise, there's a question of they need oxygen, and that should be a trigger to see whether you should get the patient to contact their airline. Asthma, similar with um, your diabetes or your diabetic patients, making sure they've got their inhalers on them at all times. And with your COPD, as with the previous guidance, thinking about are you at risk of becoming hypoxic? With a pneumothorax, you need to ensure that it's healed for two weeks and that, that actually you don't need any supplementary oxygen from this. So finally, looking at certain surgical conditions, if you've had abdominal surgery, it's contraindicated for 10 days or 24 hours after a laparoscopic intervention or a colonoscopy. And in neurosurgical procedures, it's really seven days that you can't fly. And lastly, ophthalmic, it, depending on what you've had, any trauma to the eyeball, it's one week. And then retinal detachment, there's big variation depending on what type of agents they've used to treat this. Right, going back to seeing what we can do with our plaster cast. The reason why there's a delay for past cast is because if you've fractured a bone, there's a risk of things swelling, and so actually you need to make sure that swelling's not too great. This is exacerbated by the low air pressure. So it depends, okay, on the length of the flight. If you've got a short flight, then the cast needs to be on at least for 24 hours before being fit to fly, or if it's 48 hours, um, if the flight is longer than that two hours. So the question, bit of a red herring, I'm sorry about that. There's a lack of information to make that. Again, just be very careful about being drawn to actually write a fit to fly letter. All you can say is the facts and you'll let that decision whether they're fit to fly or not rest with the airline. So, hope you found that useful. The DVLA rules ties into this occupational health um, sort of overview as well. So, hopefully you found that useful and very best luck with your AKT.